Welcome to Dear Watchers, an Omniversal comic book podcast where we do a deep dive into the multiverse. We are traveling with you through the stories and the worlds that make up an Omniverse of fictional realities we all love. And your watchers on this journey are me, Shmido. <laughs> and me, Rude Rob. Rude Rib? Something like that. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. I'm at least going for like a knockoff of myself. Yes, that's true. <laughs> which will make sense in just a few minutes to all our listeners. Well, before we begin that trip, Gita, what's new in our little section of the multiverse? Well, here we are, episode 97, three away from the big one, 100, and a few weeks away from two years of this show. We have a lot of people listening who have not reviewed or shared. Tisk, and tisk. I've, I, well, exactly. I've tried appealing to kindness and generosity, but now I'm trying shame. So yeah. if you're listening to this and you haven't reviewed us everywhere and you haven't shared us with three friends and posted on social media, then... What are you waiting for? Because mm -hmm. we are getting upset with you. Yeah, but thank you for listening. <laughs> Hannah Waddingham with the shame bell to follow you down the streets until you yes, post. <laughs> exactly. But we do thank you for listening. We just have this goal of growing to when we hit our 100th episode. And you can help us get there in the next few. So thank you for reviewing, sharing, posting. And if you are joining us for the first time, we have three parts of our journey today. Origins of the story, what inspired this other reality, exploring multiversity, we dive deeper into our alternate universe, and pondering possibilities, we examine the impact and what's followed or coming in the future. Also remember that you can support us on Coffee, dearwatchers.com. Click join. We have more content there, including a spin-off series that we've taken a little break from. We're gonna get back to, and we're sorry to our patrons busy. on there. Life is very busy as we approach 100 episodes and barely have time to record even just one so <laughs> but you can support us dearwatchers.com click join to learn more and with that dear watchers welcome to episode 97 and let's check out what's happening in the omniverse with our travels to today's alternate universe today we head to an alternate universe of laughs <laughs> as we <laughs> that sounds journey. like it's going to be a joker reference <laughs> that's true as we journey to answer the question what if the avengers fought the justice league Ooh, ah, but in a parody spoof before it happened for real many years beforehand so this is earth well this is marvel classification earth 89923 which is where a few of the what the crossover worlds are placed. It's not clear that they coexist, but whatever. We'll call it Earth 89923, part of the what the universe. And we'll talk more about what what the is in just a few minutes. We covered one sort of parody issue back in episode 22 with the Fantastic Four in the Marvelous Land of Oz. Though it was more straightforward, our true parody spoof coverage has actually been in episode 61 when we did the what if the Fantastic Four mm -hmm. had reached the moon. And that was really jokey, humorous. We've talked about trying to cover those humor what if issues, but we've never gone there. And then, of course, there's the world's funnest parody issue from the Elseworlds at DC. So we'll get to more and more humor over time. But this was a fun one to do for a few reasons. And before we dive into this alternate universe, Rob, you are going to tell us a little bit about these parody comics. But to stop you from going on and on and on and on forever, you're going to focus <laughs> in on Marvel. Yes. Okay. So there's obviously lots of parody comics. Marvel itself has had a long history with parody comics. Uh, you know, going back to 1953, Atlas, they published their first book, Crazy, which returned in 73, reprinting not brand X stories and more on that in a second. Then that had the long what's, run. Though what's wild is that's only a year after Mad. Oh, yeah. No. I'm so they're pretty early in the game. They're just not known for it. Yeah, I know. And then that that title, Crazy, that had a pretty long run, 94 issues from 73 to 80. And big, big name editors, Marv Wolfman, Steve Gerber, uh, Larry Hama. It also debuted such characters and mascots as Irving Nebish and later Obnoxio the Clown. 
which people might know from the uh, Spider-Man and the X-Men versus arcade video game. Wolverine has to be. Or Obnoxio the Clown versus the X-Men one shot from the (laughs) 1980s, which is a great, great wild one shot that one day we'll cover, I'm sure. The company that would become Marvel also published three volumes of Snafu in 1955 and 56. This includes the first appearance of future not brand Eck mascot for Bush Man and was primarily written by Stan Lee with art by John Severin, Bill Everett and Joe Manley. And then we have not brand Eck. This is one of the titles that most people might be familiar is with. Is it? Are you oh, thinking it's Eck? Eck. You keep saying no. Eck. But, Ech. you know, so, you know he's making fun of DC by saying like yes. not brand X, right? Like a yes. generic counterpart. So I always saw it as like not brand X. Like, no, I don't know. But no I think you have to get closer to the X there. sound, but you, it's like an X, but as if you're spitting at the same time, oh. right? That's what I imagine Stan like was Looney going Tunes for. Character or something. Yeah. <laughs> like X. <laughs> well, well, NBE premiered in 67 and ran for 13 issues. It, it's editors or Roy Thomas and ghostwriter co-creator Gary Friedrich, they proposed a book that would poke fun at DC because, as you said, that was their nickname for DC. But Stan thought it would actually be better to lampoon Marvel's own output. So some of the characters were Dr. Deranged, a, you know, a stand-in for Dr. Strange, an ironed man, plus contemporary parodies like they put the Marvel characters into a version of the Sgt. Pepper's cover. Other contributors including Jack Kirby, Gene Colan, again, the Severins, and then not brand X return in 2017 for a one-off issue. Marvel also had Spoof, which ran for five issues starting in 1970. That was more of a direct Mad Magazine-style book. Again, the Severins as major contributors. Big theme here. And lastly, we have our main focus of today, which is What The, which ran for 26 issues. Yeah, what The, which is a both a question mark and an exclamation point. That ran mm-hmm. for 26 issues from 1988 to 1993. It featured contributors such as The Severance. Once again, they were kind of involved in every parody book, it seems. Stan Lee, Steve Git- Ditko, John Byrne, Peter David, Kurt Busiak, and especially Scott Lobdell, who wrote on a lot of the issues, and Fred Hembeck. And Hembeck actually closed out the final issue asking the audience if they wanted to see more books. And Hembeck, of course, being the king, probably, of, like, the cartoon strip parody, especially at Marvel. Mm -hmm. And what the also prominently featured Spider-Ham, who had already Mm -hmm. premiered, but he's in there a lot. And Spider-Ham 2099. Uh-huh, yeah. Or he's actually, like, Spider-Ham (laughs) 14.08 or something (laughs) absurd, but... Yeah. And the book was, well, not actually published by Marvel, (laughs) wink, wink, but published by Marvel... And it also featured all fake ads in it, making fun of classic comic book advertisements from the past, like Charles Atlas and that kind of stuff. And there was also a YouTube revival series in 2009 that mostly featured Deadpool and MODOK. So that's a little, I'm sure there's so much more information out there on humor books and they've kind of gone away, it seems. In yeah, it's such a, culture. what's so weird is it's such a cool brand and Marvel does not use it. They've done, like, I think we covered a story actually in the Waha. They did uh-huh. like a one shot wah huh And so obviously like that, but that was even 15 years ago. And yeah. so I don't know why they haven't tried a revival no. again. And I collect a lot of horror monster magazines and famous monsters of Filmland had lots of humor in it. There were lots of other monster magazines too, that had humor and often used, I forget the term, but they have that photo. So not times just not, Sometimes the actual oh, yeah. con art, but the photos with fake captions and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Marvel that did too, some of those some of these too. Marvel books as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's a little more than a little bit of history. So Guido, it was um, a lot. Why don't uh, you uh, tell us? Oh, why don't we tell us? I'll talk a little bit about our background with what the and mine is basically zero other than knowing the title. <laughs> <laughs> And even that probably actually came from me. You probably didn't even know the title before me. Yeah, You definitely see it in a lot of the cheaper bin, not a dollar bin, but like a cheaper bin at comic book long boxes. That's that's I I would see it when I'm going through and it's like, what is this? The same thing with not brand X. It would just be one of those ones where you'd go, what what is this? I've never heard of this. And and then kind of flip past it. (laughs) Yeah, I I love what the it's it's. Uh, obviously i have a complete run it's easy to complete the run uh i've had that 
run actually since they came out. I really read this in the late 80s and early 90s. I don't know what drew me into it so much. I don't tend to like parody a lot. I think there was just something so quirky about this. And because they were using the characters I loved, it just drew me in. And mm -hmm. I don't even get I I certainly then did not get most of the jokes. Even today, I'm I don't think I get most of the jokes or yeah. a lot of the jokes. It's a bit and like so Airplane and the Zucker Brothers movies where every frame has a joke in it and some yes. of them it, it's almost quantity over quality or it is that because they just are putting so much in there and some of them you don't get and some of them aren't funny and then some of them are actually funny yeah so i i don't know i always loved it i revisited it a few years ago i i was really going through just to look at it i didn't read everything but just taking it in and because there are so many fun gags, there's so many fun ads, there's so many things I didn't even realize that they did. Obviously, there are two issues of what the that are a little more on the expensive side, if you will. One, because it's the first female Wolverine pre Laura wow. Kinney. And uh, well, I think Wolverina is what they call her, of course. And it's a parody but people like it and she's on the cover even of an issue and then of course the all the spider ham stuff so there's a few keys if you will in what the and but then there's a shocking amount of things that are overlooked to me like the issue that we get into today i don't know why it's not more valued or valuable and we'll talk about why soon well there's a bunch of cockroaches coming out from this kitchen appliance it's organisms of the stovey that's fine oh my god uh, transition that was so <laughs> horrible i don't know anyone's gonna get that but let's go <laughs> right now on this very show you're gonna get the answer to all your questions our amazing story begins a few years ago it's hard because a lot of these you have to actually read them in order to get the jokes, because it's all just slightly changing of words, so it's hard yeah, to it's make an, them up. Yeah, it's a lot of sight <laughs> gags, even with words. It's true. And for this origin of the story, we've decided not to dive into the many other parody issues, but instead let's talk crossovers. So since this is a remarkably a full-on crossover between Marvel and DC, albeit with one half's cooperation. Without one half, oh, without which I guess <laughs> means there is one half also yes, cooperating, but <laughs> the right. more that's the bad. more important part is one half didn't cooperate. <laughs> and we talked a lot about crossovers here on this show with a great discussion a few weeks back when we covered He-Man and Thundercats with Mike from Multiverse of Badness. But Guido is going to focus on Marvel and DC with a few surprising facts that I, I certainly didn't know. So the big two have crossed over pretty, a uh, pretty large number of times, I, maybe countless, but someone could count it. It's just hard because some of us are subtle. The climate has chilled to a stop and we haven't seen a crossover <laughs> other than we'll maybe a drawn in later. panel. <laughs> and we will talk more about that pa later. I've actually always dreamed of writing a guide to the big two crossovers. Maybe one day I will. But for now, here's a quick glimpse at some of where they started because it's cool it's cool when they were doing them unofficially, and then, of course, the official ones are also really cool. So you have 1967's Brave and the Bold. Batman is swinging around on a flagpole and says, oh, I'm swinging just like that other web-spinning Peter come lately. So there's a very early reference to Spider-Man in there. I don't know if it's the first, but it's certainly one of the earliest that I've seen or found out about. 1971 then has a Batman issue where Robin is telling someone at a newspaper, oh, go hire that photographer Peter Parker if you want someone that looks like me. And so there's another reference. Probably the most famous birth of their crossover is, of course, the famous Rutland Vermont oh, yes. Halloween Parade event. So it's an actual real life event. I'm not going to go into the history of it because we will cover those issues one day. They're so good. They're just not an alternate universe. So we'll have to find a way to get it in there. And so in 1970, there's the Halloween parade. Then in 1971, they show it again. 1972, you then have these writers who know each other and editors who decide that they're going to actually do a crossover unofficially, informally. But the same plot actually does go from Marvel to DC books across three books. So that is definitely the first 
major story crossover. We had talked about actually with Lance from Comic Book Keepers when we were a guest on that show, 1975's Wizard of Oz, which is the first co-company crossover. So it's the first time that they're officially working together. And as we talked about on that show, it's believed it was probably a trial run to see if they could do crossovers and how the business side of it would be. And that's why they did that, because it leads the next year into 1976's Spider-Man Superman, which has a sequel in 1981. And that's one of the big ones, right? Oh, yeah. That's the what's the first official. It's the first superhero official one. Mm -hmm. Again, you have the unofficial Rutland. Yes. I mean, there's all sorts of interesting stuff. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And mostly that stuff comes from the great research in Slugfest. And we've talked about that because they Mm -hmm. would talk about the way every even the number of panels had to be balanced and everything had to be very precise no one could throw the first punch or something because that would make that person the antagonist all that kind of thing yeah so very cool stuff the next year in 77 you get another one of those unofficial crossovers the invaders at marvel and the freedom fighters at dc both fight a team called the crusaders and that's because the writers knew each other and decided to do that so stuff like that until 1981 again you get batman hulk the next official crossover. 1982, you get the official one we did with Lance on Comic Book Keepers, X-Men Teen Titans. And that's actually it for the crossovers until you get to the, if you're calling it an intercompany crossover, what we covered today. There's no more stuff in the 80s. There's a lot of stuff in the 90s, and we'll talk about that in our third segment. And, well, it's not an official crossover, but amalgam comics which we've covered a lot here have... that's the 90s so we'll talk about okay, that in the third yeah. segment okay gotcha and there was also i'm thinking there was one issue that we covered with ethan from make my Get amalgam uh, also the 90s quasar okay okay we're we're gonna get to all of that ah. right now i focused only on the things that predate the what the that we're covering today well let us cover that with our next segment exploring multiversity Will the future... I am your guide through these vast new realities. Follow me and ponder the question. What if? And today we are asking the question, what if the Avengers fought the Justice League in a parody spoof before it happened for real? This is What The, Volume 1, Issue Number 7 from Marvel Comics from April 1990, and it's entitled Us Against Them, alternate title, The Revengers vs. Just A League. So, this is (laughs) written by Scott Lobdell, penciled by Rurik Tyler, who also did the inks, and lettered by Brad Joyce, with colors by Kelly Corvisi. And it is edited by Terry Cavanaugh and Tom DeFalco. And again, this is an issue of What The, which some of the stories might exist in a shared universe, but we're going to treat this as an isolated universe. And since What The's are actually pretty hard to find, and we're not (laughs) going to assume that our listeners have read this story, or if they did, that they remember it, we are going to actually give a bit of a summary. It's a short, so we're going to go page by page and talk about what is in this us against them <laughs> tale. Yes. So so it opens up on this page, a splash page where there are indeed as the joke is here, there are 30 characters drawn on this page. Left side you have the Avengers, which are the Avengers and all sorts of spoof versions of them. Right side, you have the DC Just A League characters Mm -hmm. and spoofs of them. And you have a few, starting with the meta jokes, which are really common in What The, where the letterer, they actually joke that the letterer dies, and then someone else fills in, and then they put like typed font in it. And so you get the meta tone here, and you get an introduction to all these characters is there one that you liked a lot or one or two that you commented that you noticed i think sore for thor's name it just makes me laugh because it's just it's kind of weird <laughs> and kind of gross almost and i like wet man i think he's dead is that dead man but he's 
but he's wet wet man. I don't know <laughs> what he is. He he's like a like wet dead, man. A wet man, but he kind of looks like dead man. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, they're all really silly. And it's the drawings actually that are, I think, that this is a standout here because you have like Hawk Mench and it yeah. looks like a person wearing Tweety Bird Tweety on Bird. his head. Yeah, totally. You have Mr. Bat Mom who has these really long uh, bat ears, bat antlers, whatever you call those on Batman's cowl. And that is a recurring joke. In this one, they're actually poking Flash in the eye. Uh-huh. And so, the other one, though, is hitting Superman in his chin, but Superman's got right. such a strong chin. It built, that it's it breaking the, it. It uh, breaks the ear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have, just for fun, in the Avenger side of things, you've got the Professor and Marianne. And <laughs> over in the Justice League side of things, you've got Cindy, Jan, and Marsha. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> just... Having a fun time. And and our secret villains, but we don't know who they are. Maybe because the artist was too lazy to draw them. <laughs> That's what it says. <laughs> and then we on our next page, we have Captain America arriving at Avengers headquarters. Of course, of course this is not Captain America necessarily. It's Charlie America. And he is assembling all of the Avengers. And we see them all come in. My favorite here being Wonder Man with Charlie Brown's head for some yeah. strange reason. I don't know why. And his name is What a Man, but I don't know why it's Charlie Brown. Yeah, it's I don't funny. Know. And then we also have a bit of a battle here in the editor's notes because Scott is Scott Lumdeer is, is explaining something, but then the other editor is saying, No, that's why we already just did that other page to show everybody. They battle it out and one of them actually gets shot to death in a kind of a grim <laughs> So there's the second death of the book because the letterer died on the first page. Exactly. <laughs> I think those I think these are the things that I love about this book though, are these very meta jokes because even there's the one caption box that says from all over the Marvel universe, they come from their own series, from canceled series, from series that should be canceled. So (laughs) all that kind of stuff I find really clever. And I think that's why I was so into it. So as the story continues, Cap says, you're probably all wondering why I gathered you here today for, which leads to a few funny jokes like Mr. Fantastic thinking they're going to direct sales only or Wonder Man thinking that they're now going to create a South Pole Avengers title and that Beast is saying the last issue is now going to come out as a trade paperback. So you really get funny jokes about the market at this Mm -hmm. point already. And those are like the kind of references that if you're just a casual comic book reader, you're probably not going to get. Like you need to be into the world of comics for those two. They're very insider baseball kind of thing. (laughs) Yes. But it turns out Caps gathered them because they're doing a membership drive and they first encounter a Marvel sales rep who tells them that to increase sales, they would need to put mutant in front of their name. And instead they're going to do a membership drive and the page closes with them doing a supathon yes. where they're trying and, to get people to join. And then at the bottom of this, of that panel there, we get two non superhero characters. It's Sammy Davis jr. And, Jerry Lewis, because, of course, the famous thing is the Jerry Lewis telethon. And Guido, Jerry Lewis is singing When You Fly Through a Storm. And that is the song uh, You Never Walk Alone, which was his theme song for these. And that we just heard because, Guido, you and I watched Eurovision. And that was the big final song from Eurovision. Oh, so it's a whoa. funny, very <laughs> timely Maybe my brain had that information encoded in it. So after we watched Eurovision, I knew this issue was the one we had to cover, but I don't think that's the case. So no, I don't think so. <laughs> Moving right so, along. Then we meet our villain, which is Kang the Conqueror, or in this case, Cranky Master of Time. And he looks kind of like And Kang. you'd be cranky too if you couldn't remember if you're coming, going, or went. Which yeah, is so a he's fun very confused. He's, he's drinking Kang Cola and he thinks, well, because this team is getting bigger, he needs another villain to team up with him. So he's going to look in the phone book to get another villain. And meanwhile, the Justice League is also auditioning new members and they're actually auditioning superhero versions of the Three Stooges. I know. I didn't even realize this, even though I see that one is going yuck, yuck. And I yes. guess there's Larry. That's why he has the L He's on his, his mask. He, wise guy A. That was one of one of them. C the is curly. Yeah. yeah. All right. I get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah. But who Cranky is going to call his fellow villains before he before we cut to the Justice League, which is a offers a fun joke that you mentioned was timely when we were uh, previewing this. 
Oh, so, yes, of course. So Cranky is looking in the phone book trying to find these villains, and he says, hmm, let's see, Doom, Donald Trump, DeFalco? Yeah, so, quite a list Quite a list of villains there. Yeah, Doom, well, Donald Trump, and poor Tom DeFalco being added and, to that list. I know. And good to see that, you know, people were still on to that uh, BS back uh, when this came out. <laughs> <laughs> So then we have the Justice League in a theater auditioning people on a stage. Of course, it's mostly men, as was the case with the Justice League. It was the case, frankly, with the Avengers too, though not at this point. And they are auditioning someone in a bikini whose name is Ivory. It's kind of a joke about soap. I don't know who it's supposed to be. She looks a little bit like both fire and ice. Maybe they're just turning her into some sort of generic saying that the heroes being drawn at this time always had to be sexy and sultry which of course is what black canary is complaining about and she says like there is just no way that this is going to undermine our integrity as a team and we're not going to fall for this and then of course all of the male heroes run after this character ivory so <laughs> and i think Lots the blue beetle fun. is supposed to be sunny bono i don't know why Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Like, no, I bet I'm it's like supposed it. to be someone at DC. I, I, I uh, doubt okay. Sonny Bono is <laughs> the but, Blue Beetle. Was pop, but that maybe. mustache was very popular during this time period. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And Especially in the bullpen, I think. Yes, totally. Yes. Yeah. So everyone had a mustache. Then on this next page, we get our other villain, or do we? It is Leeks Luther, and he's watching all of this unfold. But then he is interrupted by the poker, which is the Joker. And he says... Sorry, Leaks, you've been replaced. Seems like I'm still red hot from the movie. So the movie, the Batman, the movie. And you know Batman. the one I mean, he says. Yes, I like. Exactly. So yeah. unfortunately, Leaks has to storm off and the poker gets the call from Cranky and they're going to team up. And then we actually cut but to the... Did, did you oh, notice sorry, uh, Did you notice what's on poker's desk? What book he's reading? He's oh, reading, gosh, he's reading right Trump's there. book. There's a, there's a book there? Oh my gosh. So wow. So no lots idea. of anti-Donald Trump jokes here in this 1990 good, good comic Scott. from Marvel. <laughs> Very prescient. Uh, well, no, it's probably Rurik Tyler. A lot of them are drawn oh, in. That's true. Uh, that that's one. true. So, so if only people had read this issue, <laughs> oh, what the, the world would be a different place. And speaking of the world, we actually cut to a new, different world. It's, it's now our meta moment where we're in the Marble Quote unquote, no, office. we're in the offices of Dem Comics. Oh, now we're the, in Dem because Comics. Because DC notices okay. that, uh-oh, this is an unlicensed crossover with Marble, so there is stuff that we should have milked from this. And then <laughs> we zoom out into, like, a very meta moment and get them, get then the Marvel office looking at themselves drawing the DC office. Yes. And that's and where you get these layers upon layers. Into- in the next page, at the top of that next page, we even get the the viewer, the reader, looking at all of this, and they're looking at things, so it, it keeps going and going. Yeah, and they say, I thought it'd be a ride if we pulled away farther to show the reader spying on us, and then <laughs> that's impossible. Stop stalling and get back to the story. So a fun break, and back at the story, we have a warehouse under attack, and Cranky and Poker have discovered that this is happening. They make a fun joke about Earth 1, Earth 2, or Earth Fred. I don't know what that means, but they are just making a joke about the multiverse, which is fitting for us. And the two teams arrive. So the Justice League and the Avengers arrive to the warehouse for the trap. We find out that the Revengers call-out phrase is, Revengers reventilate! (laughs) <laughs> yes and they, and one of them says as they're arriving everyone keep alert this may be a hackneyed plot contrivance and, they're and both so they end up tricked by the same thing yeah <laughs> and they end up in battle together which is where we then just get fun panel by panel battles so let's talk about who we have here Okay, we've got Thor versus Superman or Sor versus Superman, Sup- Superb Man, and Sor says, Thou canst defeat a god who was once rendered by a mortal named Simonson. And Superb Man says, On the contrary, you cannot defeat a mortal once rendered by a god named Burn. Yes, so <laughs> lots of, there's a, I guess, John Byrne is superior to Walt Simonson is the joke there. <laughs> then we've got Charlie America versus Mr. Bat Mom and Captain America is talking about a Broadway play that he's going to be in, which we they're arguing about who's more popular. But he does say someday I'll get the Broadway play. They've been promising. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was also a Batman musical that Tim Burton and Jim Steinman were working on. And that might have been announced around this time, too. So maybe they were battling out for Broadway. And, of course, now we have Rogers the Musical. So it's all come to fruition. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. (laughs) Then we've got Iron Man versus the Marshmallow Manhunter. And there's just some jokes there about Iron Man being a heart transplanted recovered alcoholic paraplegic with a hangnail we have black and blue panther <laughs> versus visine which is black panther versus vision and it says oops in the excitement of the battle they got carried away <laughs> we have a really great panel of mr elongated man or elongated man versus mr fantastic and yeah. they're just them and their word bubbles and the caption boxes are all like intertwined as if they're all rubber and wrapped around each other so that's very cool And we close out with this page of battle with Wonder Man versus Wonder Woman. And it is just censored over and over and over again. And we see that Wonder Man is out of his boots. So (laughs) don't know what's happening on that panel or why it's happening with the only female depicted. But eh. there's another female coming up. But uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. (laughs) Then we've got Dr. Drool versus Dr. Face, Dr. Druid and Dr. Fate. And I I like that Dr. Drool says, I'm not supposed to fight anyone stronger than Aunt May. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Check my contract. It is. It is funny because he was a weird Avenger. That's true. At that time. Then we've got quick Quick sil- sli- a quick sliver. Though, gosh, that one is doesn't even really read. Quick sliver versus flash in the pan, and they're just playing tag. Silas Mariner versus a wet man, and this one's actually quite funny. So then there, let's see. Aqu- the Aquaman character says, "So how is your things in your royal city of Atlantis?" And some Mariner says, "Fine, thank you. I think I've been." I've been dethroned again. I can't keep track. How's the wife? And Aquaman says, insane. How's yours? And some Mariner says, dead. I had to kill her after she went insane. And then Aquaman says, we really should be, we really should do this more often. So yeah, that is a commentary on their fun panel. Then we have Tigra versus Hawkman and Tigra has eaten him. So she just has some feathers actually did laugh out loud this was <laughs> <laughs> then we have the beast versus blue beetle and for some inexplicable reason they are both performing like vaudeville and they have top hats and canes and are saying you say mutant i say mutant 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 tomato tomato let's call the whole thing off yeah don't know yeah, why know that's no happening idea. but it's fun <laughs> then we have jarvis versus oberon and oberon is calling him the third rate Alfred clone Jarvis. And so they have some fun jokes about janitors there. And then we get to the big page, Uh, big page, big double page, page, double page. And it's (laughs) with all the everyone fighting together. And it's actually really cool art. And we've got like a long great Easter eggs kind of coming in there. Yeah. And one of my favorites, which I didn't even notice. You had to point this out to me because I am a huge Friday the 13th fan. And we have Iron Man with the Jason Voorhees hockey mask on and a shirt that says Jason lives. I have no idea why, because Iron Man no. really has nothing to do with Jason. And but... he has a machete and looks like he's about to kill Joker. I don't yeah. know why. but And then, yeah, we have like Hobbes chasing Tigra, which of Calvin makes and Hobbes. Yeah. a little sense. <laughs> yeah. And otherwise, it's the characters we've gotten to know all engaged in different battles. And then at the end, we have the Marvel DC business folks calling down at the corner saying stop this senseless violence must end and we get to our conclusion of the story when these business folks say like that's it we need to set a good example we have to learn to start getting along and success isn't measured by who's stronger or powerful the true measure is how well he gets along with his neighbor but then they have someone run in and discover that the projected sales figures for this issue are so high that they now want to do more and more and more battles and crossovers because they're talking early retirement and they want an X-Men Watch Watchmen crossover written by Moore, penciled by Byrne, inked by Sienkiewicz. <laughs> it's just wild. I just have to pause there because yeah. that is, could you even imagine? I know it's a joke and it's a funny joke because it's so would never have happened, but my God, I like to imagine it now. <laughs> and, and it's of course the X men and the witch 
men here. Yes. But more Byrne and Sienkiewicz are, are name checked for real. And so now the editors are trying to get everyone to fight. And Terry Cavanaugh, Marvel editor, is cleaning out his desk and it closes with, I knew this was a dumb idea for a story. <laughs> and, and that is our Avengers versus the Justice League spoof from <laughs> What The. So did you enjoy reading that? Yeah, it's fun. I, it's so funny to me that I think that there's so many jokes that really would apply mostly to people who were probably really closely following the industry. Like that stuff where it says, Oh, we're going to go to direct sales and we're going to become a collected edition and all those things. It's like, well, yeah, a casual reader who's just picking this up or a kid who's just getting it. Cause this looks funny are not going to get that at all. And kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, it reminds me of those Zucker brothers movies or Mel Brooks, where there's just lots of jokes. They don't all work. Some of them probably haven't aged too well, but the sheer quantity of them, you know, that at least a percentage of them are going to be good. Yeah. Agreed. And I think, I think Rorick uh, Tyler's art is actually pretty good great through throughout especially that big splash page and that first page where we see all the people's the the roster of all the characters i think the both of those are actually really well done i agree i love his art here and why i like it is because i'm not a huge fan of fred hembeck's art just because i didn't grow up with comic strips or even underground comics as my comic book aesthetic but so this art is like cartoony enough that it works that it's a parody, but it still looks like comic book art. So I, I like his art and depiction here a lot. And it's just so fun to see what characters they wanted to play with, what jokes they wanted to make and who they wanted to match up and why. Because, of course, at this point, the JLA Avengers was was a fantasy. And I'll talk more about the reality in our next segment. But it's fun to see what they were imagining would be because even though they're making jokes like it's fun that they decided Kang would be who would go well with Lex and Joker you know like the, it, it's it, the decisions are interesting to me even though they're trying to like get a few jokes out of it clearly Wonder Man and Wonder Woman that makes a lot of sense to sure. pair them up based on the name so yeah it's just cool to see how they constructed this how Scott Lobdell constructed this well let us Talk a little bit about those future mashups, crossovers that you mentioned with our pondering possibilities. Will the future you describe be averted, averted, averted? Well, Guido, I, some of these I mentioned accidentally earlier, and of course I know that there was a dc marvel crossovers at some point so what are we talking about with our pondering <laughs> possibilities well there's so much and we just wanted to read this story for fun and, and share it with our listeners because we thought it was a lot of fun so i figured we'd pick up the back end of our history of crossovers and talk about the crossovers that followed this issue in 1990 and then speculate on future crossovers so after 1990 i'm leaving out the the Wildstorm crossovers like Wildcats and Gen 13, though ultimately those are now part of the DC universe and even canonically, so technically I should include them. But later this year, 1990, is when the Quasar unofficial okay. crossover with Buried Al Alien, Buried Alien, Barry Allen happens. Yeah. And we covered that on episode 55 with Make Mine Amalgam Ethan. And then there's a little bit of a gap uh, more one shots follow. So 1994 sees the first one shot in a while. Punisher Batman. You get makes, then Galactus makes, Dark sense. Side. Yeah. Following oh, yeah, that makes sense too. Silver Surfer, Green Lantern, Spider Man, Batman. There's two of those, and Captain America, Batman. And then that hits 96, which is where we get the finally official Marvel versus DC, DC versus Marvel crossover with the amalgam spinning out of it. So that's 96, 97. They revisited, of course, in, in all access, unlimited and access. Those were definitely right at the heart of my comic book buying, those amalgams, which we've talked about a lot, but also the Marvel versus DC, which we haven't really talked about. We have not covered the episodes. crossover. We haven't covered a lot of these. I expect that we will if we 
record another 100 episodes. We'll get to all of these eventually. And I think that it is time in our three digit episode count <laughs> to get to the Marvel versus I'm DC actual along, crossover. So I'm going to guess along with the Nightfall trade paperbacks, this Mar Marvel versus DC was probably the other er, tr first trade paperback I had because I just read the heck out of that. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's so rare they because they refuse to reprint it. So it's quite a rare trade yeah. paperback with value. Uh, so then after the Amalgam stuff in 97, you get Silver Surfer Superman, Daredevil Batman, which also has a sequel in 2000. 99, you have Fantastic Four Superman, Hulk Superman. And then, of course, the big one is finally Avengers JLA, which had been in production or at least in thought since 1980. There's actually some drawings from the early 80s. It was being worked on. And then finally, 2003 is when it's done. And that miniseries comes out. And that's it for official crossovers. Of course, it was a huge deal about a year and a half ago. They reprinted Avengers JLA as a Hero Initiative fundraiser. But otherwise, none of these books are continue to be in print. They don't reprint them. And they haven't had another official crossover. There have been, as I mentioned, a few sort of on-panel Easter eggs, especially in Spider-Man with the Spider-Verse stuff. They'll put like the Amalgam Spider-Boy in there with like his arm showing or something like that. But there hasn't been anything explicit. So there are continually rumors that there is going to be something explicit. So let's talk about both comics crossovers for marvel dc what we want to see or think we could see and then we can talk about movie crossovers because james gunn recently made some interesting comments about that <laughs> well a lot of these that that have already happened i actually haven't read but i definitely make a lot of sense and i wonder if it would be make sense to revisit them punisher batman as the vigilantes daredevil batman as the also vigilantes the, the hell's kitchen gotham city there's a lot of connections there so i could totally see those kind of characters i feel like it works best with maybe those singular characters as opposed to teams because teams can get very it can be a lot happening so i don't know it would certainly would require more than i think a single issue if you were to put the x-men up with whoever the doom patrol <laughs> i don't know how we haven't seen that yet but um yeah so yeah i think the other thing i'd like them to do is it, when we get more of these which i expect one day we will maybe the corporate overlords won't allow it i have no idea it, it seems like a stupid refusal to make money just for the sake that like there's a lot of business and yeah. legal stuff that would have to be ironed out but one day when we get these again i'd like them to pull deep deeper from the bench oh, i think great. that they they use the really main characters but some of the fun in the amalgams are seeing the characters that you don't expect to encounter each other even i know ethan is a huge fan of the Robin Jubilee romance that comes uh -huh. out of the Marvel versus DC. So I think it would be fun to see other characters other what than the, like real big ones. Like a plastic man and Ms. Marvel having the stretchy people, but he's a former criminal and she's kind of an upstanding young teen. That could be a fun Odd yeah, kind of uh, yeah. I think there's so many fun ones to fantasize about. If you're listening and you have an idea, please post and tell yeah. us what what your fantasy crossover is, not amalgam crossover, because mm -hmm. uh, I well, think there are lots of fun ones, both by power set, like you just did, totally. or by personality. I can imagine a lot of interesting people. Meeting. And I think it's interesting because i see it both ways i think the argument that a lot of people make now is well this is big even bigger ip than it was before so we're not going to see them cross over because people are so protective of it but the thing i would say and i think this especially came out reading slugfest is when they were first doing this people were very protective of their house because you had people like julie schwartz who came from the house he was the house of dc and he 
he was not going to do something with Marvel and all, all that kind of stuff. Now, I think it is so much more corporate. I don't think people have that affinity where, oh, I am just a DC person and I'm not going to let the Marvel touch this. Now we have this kind of big corporate overseeing. So I feel like. Well, I am curious way, because. Let them. And Slugfest has Slugfest gave some insight, but even just other things I've read over the years of reading comic book history, that a lot of this, including Marvel versus DC, really did come down to just people who got along and the yeah. personalities of the people. And so I think you're right to wonder if that variable has been removed because it is a corporate decision now. It's not a at the whims of individuals, mm -hmm. but... And even the individuals, yeah. I think, are probably getting along better now because there's so much more writers, right, that are moving between things. I, I it just it has to be because the, in order to keep the industry alive, where it used to probably be a lot more, you know, you you did not leave your 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 home base kind of thing. We are Marvel or die. And even for the fans too, I think there's a lot more crossover to use that word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. So. Then on screen, of course, I think that people have been since November speculating that James Gunn being at DC would open the door in part because of what you're saying, because then you do have the personality. He has the relationships. He knows the people at Marvel. He knows the world, the story, what it takes. Totally. Now leading DC films that could really open the door. But he did confirm just last month that discussions have happened. Hmm. He said, I'd be lying to say that we haven't discussed it. All discussions have been very light, very fun. And that's many years away. So oh. it's cool though, to know that they talked about it. I want to know what they talked about. Like who knows that could have even just been like James Gunn and Kevin Feige, like joking around about totally. Miss Marvel and, and elongated man or plastic man or whoever you said, but it's just cool because it makes me think it will happen one day. Yeah. Maybe I, in I our lifetime. He's he's obviously so key because he's worked now for both of these companies. The other person that I was making me think is who just recently got a big promotion to oversee really the building of the DC brand is Jim Lee. So he went from being just mm -hmm. the publisher to the president. And of course, Jim Lee had a long relationship with marvel writing the biggest so that might selling. be an example where the soiled relationship wonder, might yeah. prevent it so true, true. it could be but i was thinking oh there's another super powerful person who's now being given a promotion and really given a role to really expand the dc characters which we know have not done as well as the marvel characters so a perfect way to do that i mean whether it's in film or in comics a mashup a crossover of these two would just i can't see how it would not make money just not make money literally print money at the box office or <laughs> and it could be awful store. it could be horrible oh, it totally. could be the worst yeah. thing ever and it wouldn't matter it would make billions of dollars no i i don't see how it can can not uh tom holland meets whoever will be playing superman <laughs> <laughs> do you think that they could ever do an on-screen tv or film like what the version like do you think they a parody would ever work and and not an unofficial parody not like those porn parodies or anything like that <laughs> but like do you think that this tone almost like a she-hulk tv show tone yeah. but maybe amped up a little would work yeah, to cross them over that's a good point if they if they're too afraid to really bring the characters together in on it for for real for whatever reason the way to get around that would be to do some kind of parody crossover where you're not it's he's okay it can be captain america versus batman because it's not really captain america it's not really batman i, I could maybe see that yeah. happening just well you know what started that, yeah i was just thinking the same way that amalgam could make sense is because okay we could amalgamate these characters because it's not really having both characters in both ways it kind of gives them a little bit of an an out that's true i was gonna say that what you're making me realize is that the one franchise that has slightly done that with a few funny jokes and could be the door opener, though I don't think it will be next year, but in the future beyond is Deadpool. 
totally. Deadpool has had a few jokes about DC movies in it. And so it essentially was acting as a what the. And so I could see Deadpool if it has some fourth wor- fourth wall breaking meta humor, which it surely will. Maybe that becomes the doorway to doing this down the road. Totally. Not a, not I, again. This is not speculation for next year. But <laughs> and on the DC side, maybe the Harley Quinn animated show as well, if that keeps going. And like right now, I, there's the mini series coming out. Harley screws up the multiverse, and it's a oh, cute yeah, series where she just jumps around and is messing up the DC yeah. multiverse. They already so, were bringing yeah. in real people. Like they had Brett Goldstein as himself in as, as a version of himself. So it could just yeah, be the in the, that's true bring, in the TV, in, in the cartoon in Marvel characters. Yeah. So a lot of fun to ponder. We'll cover all these crossovers in our next hundred episodes <laughs> and hopefully more what the, because I also love that title. So for now though, that is a wrap. Dear watchers, thanks for listening. I have been Shmido again, the knockoff Guido. I have been, I don't even remember what I said. Rude rib. Sure. <laughs> I don't know why. The reading <laughs> list is in the show notes. You can follow us, talk to us, tell us what crossovers you want to see on all social media at Dear Watchers. Leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, or we'll sick Hannah Waddingham with her shame bell on you. And we'll be back soon with another trip through the multiverse. In the meantime, in the words of Terry Cavanaugh, I knew this was a dumb idea for a story. 